All right, that was well done. Well, last Sunday, am I getting some crazy stuff here? We'll see. Last Sunday, I mentioned I was going to be speaking on the Reformation today. Many of us, you know, we've heard of it, but we don't really know what caused the Reformation, what started the Reformation, why did it happen? And then Sunday night happened. How many of you guys remember what happened this past Sunday night? You guys remember the Las Vegas shooting? 59, 58 people killed, 489 injured. And as I was going through, in fact, on Monday I came in and I actually wrote the sermon like I thought I was going to, and I finished it, and it was done and ready to go, and the Tuesday morning got in the office, and it's just like God saying, look, you're not going to give that sermon, you're going to give a different one. And so I prepared a different one, and then as I was doing more reading throughout the week, it was just like God was giving me confirmation that, yep, this is what you're supposed to do. We're going we're to change gears today a little bit. We're going to talk about this whole idea of what, or where is God when the world is falling apart? Where is God when the world is falling apart? And this was a question that I saw people had all week long as I was reading different, even news articles, and even this morning reading news articles just on evil. Where does evil come from? What is evil? Did God cause evil? Is God allowing evil to happen for a reason? What's God doing in the middle of this? These are articles that's on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and all these different things. People are just wondering, what's happening here? Why are these things happening? And so for some of us, we want answers, don't we? Where's the motive? They're still looking for the motive. What's the motive for this? What's happening? And we think, well, where is God? While we weren't directly impacted by that, I would wager a guess that there's many of us that we've had times in our lives where we have wondered, where's God? Where's God? Have you ever wondered that? Again, don't raise your hands, but I bet we've had those times. You wonder, where in the world is God right now? Why are these things happening to me? Sometimes it's obvious why they're happening. We make bad choices, things like that. But there's other times we're just blindsided by it. And it's the blindsided when we're blindsided, but that's when it hurts. Where is God when we're falling apart? And there's a Bible passage, Psalm 46, that speaks very clearly to this idea. Answering this question, where is God when the world is falling apart? The idea of the sermon is this. Psalm 46 teaches it doesn't matter what you're going through. God is still present and he is working. It's interesting. I was going to speak on the Reformation. We had the songs all picked out. Mighty fortresses are God, right? A great song of the Reformation. Martin Luther wrote that song based on Psalm 46. Came right out of Psalm, chapter 46, Psalm 46. And it was just an interesting thing how even during the Reformation, people were wondering, God, what are you doing? And that the truth from Psalm 46 is still true today as it was 500 years ago, as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. You know, right now, it seems like our world is falling apart. Can I get an amen to that one? Come on, people. I mean, we're there, right? It feels like the world is falling apart. I mean, even something simple like the Las Vegas shooting, 58, 58 dead, 489 injured, things like that. But even earlier this year, what? All the hurricanes, right? The millions and billions of dollars worth of damage that was done and the people who will never be able to move back home and who lost their possessions. And you wonder, God, what's happening? What's all this stuff going on here? We had all the wildfires that, frankly, those things we didn't hear about because of the hurricanes. But they were terrible wildfires. And they were just horrific this year we've had that we didn't hear much about because of everything else that was happening on top of it. And then, you know, with all this stuff, the natural disasters and some of these other things, you've got the political turmoil that's happening right now in our country. I mean, there, it's just crazy when you sit and read about it. You can see the diversity and you have people who are blaming the Republicans and the Republicans are blaming the Democrats and all these things. And, and we don't feel sorry for them because most of them are Republicans anyway who got killed, right? Comments like that were just like, what in the world is going on? The political divisiveness of our country. It's crazy. We sit there and we look and say, man, God, do I want to raise my kids in this atmosphere? I want to move to Australia. That's what my brother says. He wants to move to Australia, right? Let's go to Australia. That's a good idea except the poison snakes down there. I don't like that. Anyway, but we look around the world and things are just seemingly falling apart, aren't they? But then we get to Psalm 46. Psalm 46, and let's read. There's an outline there in your bulletin if you want to follow along in the outline, fill in the blanks. But Psalm 46, and there are pew Bibles. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's pew Bibles underneath the chair. But in Psalm 46, verse 1, we read this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. 
Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. God, we just got done reading your word, and Lord, now we're asking that you would open our eyes to what you have for us to learn today. Guide our time today, Lord. Be with us. Be in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This Psalm 46, it's, it's interesting in there as you read through it, the different things that the psalmist is talking about when he wrote this. Things that we can identify with. Things that we can say, yep, that's true in my life. Absolutely true in my life. The first thing I'm going to talk about is God is present even when everything changes. Okay? Even when everything changes, God is present. Let's look again at Psalm 46, 1 through 3. It says this to the choir master, the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, he will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah, what do we see from this? Think about how we identify these things, things he's talking about. You got the mountains, you got the sea, these things that are shifting, that are changing. What does this mean for us? Well, God is present when the very foundation of our lives is rocked. And some of us can identify with that. We've had things in our life that we thought, this is going to be here with certainty. This is going to be here. We make wedding vows to one another. And then our lives are rocked. Our children are born. We have this idea that, that no parent should have to bury their child. And it's true. No parent should ever have to bury their child. And some of us had to. Your world is rocked. You have this thing that you're counting on, whatever it might be, and your world is rocked. Your foundation, whatever it is, you think, you know what, my parents will never, my parents will never do that, and then they do. I'm not going to have to take care of my mom and dad, and then you have to. Things, whatever it is, there's foundations in our world, these things that you think we can count on, and they're not. The things that we can count on, when they're taken away, God is still present. God is present. These things, that whatever it may be, remember when 9-11 happened and the stock markets crashed and all of a sudden people that we knew, good friends with, had to go back to work because they lost half of their income. Half their retirement, not just half their income, half their retirement was gone. Things they thought they could count on. And those are things you wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? And God is still present when those things are here. God is still present when those things are gone as well. God is present in all these things. And I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know the situations you've been through, but I'm sure that all of us can identify with some of these things. Think, yeah, God, there's something like that in my life. There's been something like that that I thought I could count on that's no longer there. Sometimes it's our health, right? It's our health. We think, man, God, I, I can do anything, and then, we get, and then we get injured. Our health goes, and all of a sudden we get angry. God, I can't do this anymore. Why can't I do this anymore? God, why did you let this happen to me? I got a family to provide for. Why is this happening? God is still present. The psalmist says, even though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, you sit there and you think about it. These are things that are concrete. These are things that are foundational to the earth. And the psalmist says, even when those things are gone, God, you're there. God is present and all of those things. And God is present when we become overwhelmed by the forces of this world. When we sit and think about the world we live in, God is still present. And yes, is there evil present in the world today? Absolutely, there is evil present in the world. And sometimes we get overwhelmed by the evil. God is still present. Sometimes we get overwhelmed by just, by life in general. And God says, I am still present in all of that. I'm still present. I've got a story I want to share on this one. Some of you have heard it. Many of you have not. In 1998, as a freshman in college, I started in August 1998, September 1998, to get a phone call from my sister. My grandfather, 78 years old, the sole provider for his family. He was a farmer all his life, worked construction, didn't have retirement to speak of. My father was at the farm that day. They were working, unloading some equipment from a semi-tractor. Dad was backing up the semi-tractor and trailer. Grandpa didn't see him. Dad didn't see Grandpa. He walked behind the trailer. My dad ran over him with the semi-trailer. Ran up on his leg. My grandpa grabbed hold of where it came up on his chest, but then it slid on the gravel road and it slid on his leg. He was life flight to the hospital. He was in the hospital for three months. In and out of, in and out of consciousness on morphine. He, didn't, he was an angry person on morphine, throwing bedpans, yelling at my grandmother. That was not my grandfather. But that's what he was. 
And I remember thinking, God, what are you doing? This is my grandfather. This is the man that, that I grew up with. This is the man who lived just a mile from me. I went and we restored tractors together. We built things. We, we raised sheep together. All these things. God, why are you doing this? And I hurt. And I hurt. And I know sometimes you can relate to that. You think, God, why did you do this? Long story short, for the sake of time, long story short, Grandpa got better. He was able to walk. They didn't think he'd ever be able to walk. They saved his leg. The people who owned the semi-tractor, the company who owned the semi-tractor, that my dad was back in at the time, that paid for my grandpa's retirement, that accident did. They gave him such a big settlement check, he never had to work another day in his life. He got to around all day on the, lawn, on the tractor, and he loved it. His dream came true. My grandmother and him had the best relationship to the point I've ever seen in their life, because now he was home every day, and that's what she wanted. She wanted a man who was home. In the middle of that heartache, I said, God, why? And he, two years later, looked back and said, God, now I see why. God was present. My grandfather in 2000, in June of 2000, he able to walk down the aisle as my best man on my wedding day. One of the best memories in my life. And I sit there and I think, man, God, thank you. Yes, it hurts, but God was present. God was present in the middle of that. The other thing we know is that God is present even when everyone is against you. And look at the last part of this, beginning in verse 6, right down here. It says what? The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. We look at that and we see, yes, the nations are raging. We see the kingdoms are falling apart and all these things. And we see we don't know what's happening, okay? It seems like everyone's against us. And what's it say at the beginning? It says this. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. And that makes more sense. You look at verse 4, or verse 3, where it says, Though its waters, though its waters were in foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Do we see the, the, the contrast there? It's talking about the oceans that's roaring and foaming and boring against us, coming against us. And then God says, But wait, there is a river. There's this little river whose streams are what? Whose streams make glad the city of God in the middle of this turmoil, in the middle of these people coming against us, in the middle of the kingdoms raging, tottering, falling apart. God says, he says, look, he says, I'm going to be your provision because there's a river. In the middle of this, there's going to be some things that's going to bring joy to your heart. There's going to be some gladness in your heart. And that's some of the hardest thing to do. But in the middle of the trauma, in the middle of the trials, God says, there's some good things in there. Will you see them? Will you see the good things? Will you see how I'm working in the middle of this? And it's hard, isn't it? Sometimes we, we don't want to see how God's working because we're so angry. But God says, I'm there. I'm there. My provision is there for you. Will you look? Will you see the little bit that I'm giving you to bring you gladness? I'm giving you enough. I'm sustaining you. And then he gives us that certainty that we have in the middle of all this. Again, going back to Psalm 46. He says in verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God says, look, I'm in the middle of this. This provision I'm giving you, I'm causing that provision. I am there. Will you see me? Will you look for me? It's not easy, is it? On Sunday night, we became a nation that, for many, there was a nation of rage. Were they looking for God to work? Were they looking for God in the middle of that? Not necessarily. But I imagine there were some that were, God says, I was there. I'm in the midst of all of this. Yes, you may not understand, and we don't have to understand. We don't have to. We don't have to understand, but God says, I'm still there. Will you trust me? Will you understand the provision I give you? Will you understand the security in my presence? Will you understand the comfort that I have in the middle of chaos, that comfort that I bring to you, the joy, the gladness? God says, I will help you. God will bring us help. And it may not look like anything you ever pictured. It may blow your mind when you actually sit and look at it. January 29, 2015, I'm called in the church office. I'm told on that Friday, I'm told that my career is coming to an end within a few months there, probably by August or September, they tell me that we're restructuring the church. That's fine, because in the middle of January, my wife and I have been talking, we knew some restructures were coming, and we thought, you know what, this is the time when maybe I need to change jobs, begin working somewhere else. We weren't surprised by that conversation. We began thinking, okay, we don't know how long we've got and things like that. It'd be kind of nice to have, have a time frame. But in January 29, I get that, have that conversation. I'm going home trying to figure out how to tell my wife that in a few months, six or seven months, we may have to move. That night, I get home and I get a phone call at 6.30 from a church who says, we want you to candidate as our senior pastor. That very night, I haven't even told my wife yet. 
And I'm like, wow, God, the provision, right? In my time of need, God, you're there. February 22, called in the office again. They said, pack your bags by tomorrow or you lose your severance. Somebody in the church had gotten upset at something that I had done unjustly. In fact, so much so that half the elders came back to me afterwards and said, this never should have happened. I was gone 24 hours later. Now, all of a sudden, my life changes. And you talk about anger, and you talk about hurt, and you talk about wondering, God, what in the world? Why is this happening to me? And then that church that I called me in January, when they heard I got let go, they said, well, we don't know the reasons. We don't need to know the reasons. You were let go, so that's enough for us. We're going to let you go, too, before we even hire you. I was two weeks away from the final candidating process. Two weeks away. We had the date set for me to come in and candidate with a vote. And they let me go. That was on a Tuesday. Two days later, my wife and I were still grieving that. Two days later, we had another church that said, hey, we want you to come be your candidate. We've heard about you. We want you to come. We don't care what that church did. We don't agree with what that church did. We want you to come. So I did. Again, two weeks away from the final candidate weekend, there was conflict within there, and they, they canceled it. But the week that they canceled it was the same week that Grace Baptist called me. So we want you to come out and interview. You want, you want God's provision in the time of trial? That was the hardest period in my life I've ever had. I can remember sitting with my wife and weeping when we put a for sale sign in our, church, in our yard. We didn't know what it was going to do. We didn't have a job yet. We didn't have the candy. We didn't have any hope at that point. We're going to move home with my parents. 35 years old, four kids, moving back to my parents' basement. Yes! Everyone's <laughs> dream. But you know what? God was there. My severance ran out in May. You want some provision. My severance ran out in May in the middle of June. It was, I got two weeks paycheck, right? It expired June 15. And I think it was June 13, I got a phone call from a friend who said, Pastor, we understand what happened to you. And we feel so strong and God has something for you that we do not want you to get a part-time job. We are going to pay your bills entirely out of our savings until you find a job. Doesn't matter how long. One year, two years, five years. Doesn't matter. We're paying your bills. You send us your budget. We will send you a check. And they did. All summer long, they sent me a check for $3,000 every month, all summer long. And then I started working. I don't know what I was thinking. I should have told you guys, dude, I'm set, people. But that's God's provision. I've never heard of a pastor who had those things. But you want rage, you want anger, you want chaos, I was there. I can remember the hurt. Our house is empty. Our kids are in tears. They're sleeping on mattresses on the floor thinking, why do we have to move from Omaha? And I said, I don't know the answer. What are we going to do? I don't know. We're stepping outside the house at 10 o'clock at night and I'm throwing plastic bottles at the garage. I'm so mad. My friend Ed Carroll, who's one of my mentors, just showed up at the house. At 10 o'clock at night, God sent him to me. At 10 o'clock. I remember crying and weeping and wailing because, God, I don't understand what you're doing and I know you've had times like that in your own life. God, why is this happening? And God says, I'm there. Will you see me? Will you see me work? Because I am there. God is present. Even when everyone is against you and God is present and working, we have to acknowledge him. The last part of Psalm 46 says this. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he's brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Think about it. Think about these things. God says, look at me. Look at what I can do. He says to us, he said, look at God's power. He says in Psalm 46, he said, I can do these things, okay? I can make war cease. I can bring the earth to desolation. I can break the bow. I can shatter the spear. I can burn the chariots with fire. In your life, what has God done? Because he's done some miraculous things. Think about the fact in 1 John 4, 10, it says what? That he sent his son Jesus to die for us. We didn't love him, but he loved us. And his son was a propitiation chapter 4 says the propitiation which means what? the appeasement of anger we have a God who is angry with us and what did he do? he sent his son to take away the anger that's a miracle that's a loving God and we cannot forget that loving God God says look at what I've done look at my power do not forget what I can do I can do some miraculous things I've done them in the past and I can still do them today I am still the same God and in the middle of the heartache in the middle of the conflict when you begin to doubt God's power God says no don't doubt look at what I can do look at what I've done before and I am continuing to do I am here 
I am working. I am present in your life today. And then he says this. He says, stop fighting me. He said, be still. And you say, why does he say be still? You ever try to take a splinter out of a child? You ever try to take a splinter out of a child? Three, four, five-year-old child? 52-year-old child? You ever try to do that? <laughs> What do you do? You grab hold and say, be still already. I know it hurts. I know you can't walk right. I know you can't use your hand right. Whatever it is, I know it hurts, but you're fighting me. You're pulling away from me. You're running from me. All I want to do is take the pain away. God says, be still and know that I am God. And let me tell you, it is hard in the middle of the hurt to be still, isn't it? It's hard because it does hurt. And we know that when they dig it out, it's going to hurt even more. Yes, absolutely, for a temporary time. God says, be still already. When we're going through the hurt, when we're going through the trauma, when we're going through whatever it is, God is there. But people try to rest in Him. Stop fighting Him and rest in His presence. The very last verse, verse 11, the Lord of hosts is what? He is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You know, in a hard time, in the middle of a war, you are foolish if you run outside the fortress. But how many times do we do that? We're in the middle of a hard time, in the middle of a trauma. So what do you do? We run away from God. And that's the craziest thing we could do. God says, be still. Stop fighting me. Rest in my presence. That's the God that we know. So why do these things happen? So what, what do we do with all this? Well... There's a story here I want to share. A story of Mary, Mary Verghese. Any of you ever heard of Mary Verghese, this Christian woman? She's from the nation of India. She's a Christian doctor. There's a story I came across this week. In fact, I got to watch an interview of, of Dr. Mary, who was talking about how her work with Bible translators, translating the Bible to the native language and many of the people she works with, so that they too could hear about the gospel. But in January, January 30, 1954, the motor car carries the medical students and doctors, including Mary. It tumbled over in a major road ac accident. Mary was among the two who was seriously injured. Her face was badly smashed in. Irreparable spinal damage rendered her a paraplegic. Dr. Paul Brand, a doctor from America who was over there at the time, he's done a lot of work with leprosy, with the disease of leprosy. Dr. Paul Brand was actually one of the physicians working with her. And he said this, he said there's three battles, first a battle for life, then a battle for activity, and finally a battle for faith. Can we identify with that sometimes? We may not worry about our lives, but God, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do anymore. And God, why? The battle for activity and the battle for faith are things that we can identify with. We're there. We're absolutely there. When Mary had recovered enough to understand the full extent of her injury and learn that her limbs had paralyzed, she faced blank despair. She said, Why? Why couldn't God have let me die? She'd wanted to serve as a doctor, but now she faced the prospect of spending the rest of her life being served instead of serving others. This Dr. Paul Brand, who coincidentally, if you believe in that word, happened to be there. As he's watching Mary, as he's working with Mary, he saw potential in a broken individual. He suggested that she consider a field of medicine different from what she'd planned. He invited her to join his department to be trained in operations on the hands of leprosy patients, which could be done while seated on a chair. Quiet by nature, she did not respond initially, but she took time to think it over. And finally, she agreed to give it a try. She attended clinics, she did ward rounds, and she was soon performing surgeries in the operation theater. She was then probably the only paraplegic surgeon actually performing operations anywhere in the world. And she was one of the greatest hopes for the leprosy patients. As they came to her and saw this doctor who was a paraplegic stuck in a wheelchair, and they compared that to their own disease, their own illness, the hope, the comfort that Mary's story brought to them was more than any other healthy doctor could do for them. That emotional help. Dr. Mary now, she works with Franklin Graham. She does some amazing things. And she sees what God was doing, even in the middle of this hard time. The Bible speaks to this in John chapter 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And when troubles come, well, you shouldn't be surprised. But why do these troubles come? This is a great verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. When you're in the middle of a hard time, when you've lost a loved one, the one who matters the most to you, who can hurt, that can comfort you the most, is the one who's also lost a loved one. When you've lost a job unfairly and you don't know what to do, the one who comforts you the most is the one who's also lost a job unfairly. One week before I told I was going to lose my position, one week we had the brother of Alvin Weiss in our home with his wife. He was a pastor. And he, through God's timing, his wife said, I'd never heard him tell those stories of anybody before, not even our kids. He began to open up at our dining room table that night. He began to tell story after story after story of churches that had hurt him. One week before I knew I was going to need that comfort. I remember seeing him just a couple weeks after that and said, you have no idea how much your stories comforted me. That's what we can do. When we go through hard times, we can comfort others with the same comfort that we receive from God. God wants us to do that. So when those hard times, yes, it's okay to be hurt. It's okay to look for answers, but don't forget God. God is present and he's working. And then at the end of your hard times, what do we do? We can bring comfort to others. We understand that sometimes there's nothing you can say. Just that hug is the biggest thing. You know, we weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. And we learn to value that. We learn that, yes, when you're going through the hard time, I know God is still present. I know God is working, right? Don't come and quote Bible verses. Just come and hold me because that's what I need. I need to feel a presence, a comforting presence. And we can learn to give comfort when we ourselves have been through a situation where we needed that very comfort. All of us in here have been through hurts, some greater than others. All of us have the ability to comfort. When we think about the so what in all our lives, the so what, why does God allow these things to happen? He allows these things to happen so that we can reflect the love that he has given us to others around us who need to know that God is present and God is working. God, God, we don't have to understand why you do the things that you do, but God, we do need to understand that you are present and you are working and you are still the same God today as you were then. You're still the same God today as when the psalm was written, as when the earth was created, as when you sent your own son, Jesus, to die for us. And God, we all experience different hurts. We live in a fallen world that shouldn't surprise us. Lord, sometimes we get angry and sometimes we get upset. God, forgive us for those times in our lives when we don't seek you. Those times in our lives when you're yelling at us to be still! And we won't. God, today we've been singing songs about how great you are. And we're going to leave again on the song talking about how great you are. And God, I pray that we would never forget your greatness. It's easy to remember in the goodness, in the good times. But God, help us to remember in the bad times just how great you really are. And I praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.